I won't make this too long, but I thought it'd be interesting just to very quickly go through why we changed names. And I feel like I'm setting myself up here because no one, no one likes to change names. And I, I'll just give you the arguments for why they changed and then we can see whether anyone can defend them. But I call it the good, the bad and the ugly because in my view, there are names changes that are good. There are ones that are bad and there are some that are just, just a bit irritating. So I'll get to that in a moment. But I just the first bit I wanted to talk about was really just the whole point of why we change names. And you, you would all know this, but physics, you know, is it a flat or a spherical world we live on? Medicine, do you want leeches or antibiotics? In plant systematics or name changes or classification or nomenclature or taxonomy, things do change. We get new knowledge and we want to reflect that in the name. So I always give this example that because I work on algae, as many of you will know or used to, and 2000 years ago, everything, every alga, every seaweed was called phycos. 300 years ago, there are four different genera for all the seaweeds in the world. And you don't need to sort of use your imagination too much to realize there's more than four out there. And there's now thousands of genera of seaweeds and other algae. So stuff changes, so the names change. That's the first point. They're going to change, they're not gonna stay the same as we learn more about them. It all goes back to this guy here. Um, this is when I was in Uppsala decades ago and they had a reenactment of Carl Linnaeus sort of walking through his garden. And he's responsible for the names we use today. Uh, everything mostly that we use you know, sort of dates back to this 1753 when he set up the system. Now, I borrowed a few ideas here. This was a, a, a talk that Peter Valder gave many years, many, many years ago on ABC radio. And I just uh, used his examples, but he made the point that Binomials are, are almost universal and old. So, you know, we, we talk these days, meat pie, chicken pie, apple pie, blue gums, even when we use common names, they often go, it's you know, that kind of gum or it's that kind of pie. And so there's a, there's a, a logic there between those two names. Yet before Linnaeus, uh, things, plants, animals, everything had these huge long descriptions and that was their name. So if you wanted to describe this particularly, particular gladioli, you had to use that whole bit in Latin, which translates into English as I've got there on the slide and noting that the English is much longer. So Latin is a little, a little bit already of a succinct form, but of course, very, very unmemorable. So Linnaeus comes along and he says, look, we need a simpler system. He did think initially we could just give them numbers. So it's gladiolus number one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that would kind of work up to a point. But in the end, he decided this, this idea of a genus and a species Gladiolus angustus or angustus angustus, the, the narrow gladiolus. So it's a, it's, a, it's a gladiolus with narrow leaves. Doesn't have that full description, doesn't tell you everything, but it's a way of talking about the plant. And if, uh, it might have been um, Peter that said this, but Linnaeus wrote in the kind of Latin Romans might have used if they sent text messages. So he's, he's sort of setting up a system that's it's quick and easy to talk about. Uh, and he devised a system of classification. This is very important. So it's not just a name. That name tells you something about the plant. The one he set up was deliberately artificial and you have things like trees, shrubs and vines. I'll just go to the next picture. This is a, an early scheme, which you can see there in, in red there that plants are being divided up, whether they're a herb, a shrub or a tree. Now, you know, that's not gonna work. It's all, put all the trees together. You're gonna leave out things that are we know are very closely related based on flowers and all kinds of things. So that, that kind of system didn't work. And again, things change, things evolved. The purpose then of a name, just to repeat this, and this comes from what's called the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. That's actually changed names, I'll get to in a moment. But the name of a taxonomic group is not to indicate its characters or history, but as a way of referring to uh, to it and to indicate its taxonomic rank. So a name doesn't have to mean anything. A name can be meaningless, can be a name that doesn't refer to a character that uh, applies anymore because we sort of understand things differently. It really is a name that just sits there and stays with it. And that is also very important to remember that the, we, might, we might prefer a name that's sort of more helpful, but it doesn't always, uh, it isn't always the case. I give you this wonderfully recent example that some of you may well know of, and Whistlia, because it's an alga and it's a seaweed and it grows near, uh, down Tassie Way, Jennifer, uh, near Hobart in the subtitle. Now I put this because, well, to show off of course, because I've had something named after me, but also 
it's a, a genus named after me with a species name meaning Bella, beautiful. And so technically it's the beautiful ant whistle, that little red thing there on the side, but it's also in its family and, and an order. Now there's this hierarchy that we have in plant names. That's important, doesn't always matter too much and probably not for today's discussion, but it's really important to see names as sitting in this hierarchy. So when things change up higher, it sometimes means things change down lower. And in this particular case, this thing is so distinctive, it's in its own family and in its own order. And I do need to very quickly remind you that an order is a primate. Primates are an order, spiders are an order, uh, pinales, all, the, all the, the, the pines, including uh, cypresses, including araucaria, including cedars are all in an order. So this that's kind of the hierarchy. And then there are families below that. And there's our lovely Wallamai pine. I, I love, I'm not going to talk about it here, but I love comparing the Wallamai pine to Ent Whistler bella because they're both very rare. And Ent Whistler is more distinct taxonomically or more interesting scientifically than Wallemia, but I won't make that case today. I'll leave that for another one. Um, so the rules we use are, are pretty well defined. It's like, it is a legal system. Every name is linked to a single preserved specimen, a type we call it. So there's a herbarium specimen usually, and there's a lot of subtlety in that, but let's just say there's a herbarium specimen somewhere that carries that name. And when we change anything, we go back to that specimen, we check what that name's called. And that's important because it means it, it sticks with that particular look and that particular type of plant. There is only one correct name technically. Now that's sort of right. Um, that's right at species level, so but it's not necessarily right at genus as we'll get to. So you you know for an orchid at the moment you can use a, a number of different names depending on where you are in Australia and what your persuasion is, and they're not incorrect. So there's one correct name at the species, and that's just a subtlety in that one. Uh, and it's generally the earliest name. So that's another thing to keep in mind. It's very irritating at times, but the earliest name is the correct name. So sometimes if it, an old name's dug up, that becomes the name we need to use. I mentioned starting dates, just, just to be aware of this, that they all go back to the things we're talking about today, mostly will go back to Linnaeus. And that's 1753 when he published his first publication. That's the starting point. They did that because there's these binomials, as we call them, the genus and species, hanging around a bit before that sometimes, and we're just not sure if they're, you know, how, if they're meant that way. And of course, they were before the system was set up. So they go back to 1753. And there's a whole bunch of other dates for um, fungi and algae and other organisms and bacteria. So if you delve into those worlds, you'll find the, the rules are similar, but the dates are a bit different. And on that, let me just uh, point out that the code, just call it the code or the nomenclature code, botanical code, is now called the code of nomenclature for algae, fungi and plants. So they've brought them together and they're being very clear that it applies to all of those. But there are codes for animals, there are codes for bacteria, there's codes for, there's a code for cultivated plants, which I won't talk about today. It's probably, you know, is of interest to us here, but it's a, it has a few subtleties and it's probably not the key thing we're talking about. And there have been just uh, discussions in recent times about trying to bring all those together into a single code called a bio code or a phyla code. I raise that because if that did happen, it might make some changes to the way we use names because, for example, in um, zoology, an animal name, if they've got a subspecies, you know how we say subspecies this or variety this, they leave out that word subspecies and variety, they just run it together so you get three words in a row in italics. That's a minor difference but you would notice that dramatically if you're you know typing up in a publication or something but that's not happening at the moment uh, and fossils also have their own uh, sorry fossils are covered by the relevant code to, with a, a few special provisions um, i don't need to go into the difference of the codes because we're not really talking about those other ones but there are different as i said different ways of citing the name starting dates and elect electronic publications a little bit different and that separation of the codes is based on the old fashioned system. And this is actually not a bad, this, this one done in 1866, it's pretty progressive. There's animals, plants, and there's what are called protists, all the small stuff in the middle. But these days, fungi, for example, are closer to the animals and not in plants. And there's a lot of uh, more research done since those times. Now, this is the most complicated picture in this presentation, 
but it's it's just good to be I think it's useful to, to be aware of it because if you're reading a, a paper or you're trying to understand why a name has changed, quite often these days, they'll say this particular group or genus or whatever it is, family could be, is monophyletic. And what they mean by that is it's a group of species, a group of things that have a common ancestor and it's all the descendants of that ancestor. So two points, it has a common ancestor so it comes from the same point, you know, if you draw the tree of life and as you got uh, one here, and this is with monkeys and humans and various uh, related animals, it's if you need the common ancestor and you all, so if I down here, the, these points here where the common ancestor is, but also everything that comes from that ancestor. So for example, this yellow group is monophyletic. That's the term, that's what we're after, a monophyletic group. That means in an evolutionary sense, we believe that all those organisms came from a common ancestor and element. We've captured them all in this group and we can therefore say they share certain characteristics. And that's the advantage. That's the predictive power. We can say they share, that if we see a couple of things in common, we can assume they share more, even things we haven't discovered yet. So if we left humans out, for example, of that primate group at the top, um, then that would not be monophyletic. That would be leaving out some of the ancestors. That's why there's a whole bunch of reasons why you don't pull humans out of apes, but that's one reason. If you look at the blue group, the light blue group, that's what, you don't have to worry too much about paraphyletic and polyphyletic. They're, they're just different terms. What they mean is it's not monophyletic. Paraphyletic means you're leaving out things. So example, if I you did the apes without the humans, that would be paraphyletic. Polyphyletic is the is probably a more traditional one where you know you get say if that was cacti and euphorbs the big succulents that look the same you know, from Africa and America if you put them in the same group that would be paraphyletic they're totally different they're not related as you all know flowers look totally different so they just happen to have uh, stems or you know that look green green and thick and look a bit the same so that wouldn't be a natural group so we're looking for these natural groups that becomes important when you're reading papers on this. Um, so the good, the bad, the ugly, let me just run through what I mean by that. The ugly names are when you discover one that has priority. So an old name gets discovered in the literature. And you might think, well, why would you bother looking for those? Why don't you just sort of pretend it's not there? Um, well, someone will find it eventually. And someone in another country, for example, may be using that name. And this is where it becomes important. And you'll remember this with acacia and wattles, perhaps. Uh, it's very important to, to know where sort of you know where where the which of the which name takes priority. If we dig up an old name, there's really no gain in information content. So this is not that's why I say this is kind of it's ugly. It's neutral, but it's kind of ugly. You don't you don't the earth doesn't become spherical from being flat. You're not being told anything new. No new cure for cancer in that. But um, it's important for the stability of names and can only be ignored with good rationale. So we can what we call conserve names. So for example, with acacia, that was conserved eventually for Australian plants, uh, even though the oldest name, or so the, the name applied to a, an African species, and it, technically when they split the genus up, so when they split off the African species from the Australian, and you've got to accept, we don't got to accept, but let's, let's take, uh, accept the fact that the taxonomists think those two are distinct groups now based on what they've been studying. Once you do that, Acacia should have stayed in Africa. And because there's more species in Australia, because arguments were made, it was conserved, but that's a very unusual circumstance. And South Africans are still very unhappy with that decision. It's never been accepted particularly well there and may never be because that's the trouble. If you don't follow priority, you start to get into disputes about the right name to use. And a good example of priority is one that you possibly know, Eucalyptus rostrata. Uh, was used for the river red gum for quite a while. I, I think even when I started, I don't know when I started uni, but close to that, it was being used a little bit. It was described in 1847, but an earlier name was discovered, Camalgelensis, which is published in 1832, because the plant got um, described from a garden in, in Italy, a monastery garden, and it, it grabbed the name Camalgelensis, so that was the name given to it. And that becomes the name of the river red gum. So it's the oldest name, therefore the name we use we're sort of used to that now, most people, I think. I think we've sort of got over that change, but that took decades to get used to. And that was 
what I'd call an ugly change. No, no new information came from that other than a lovely story about the river red gum growing in a garden in Italy. And you can explain why, you know, it gets named in Europe rather than Australia. But apart from that, no new knowledge about the plant. Now the bad ones though, is when it doesn't result in any new information. And these, these for example, um, that are, un yeah, when people unnecessarily introduce new names would be the category here. Now I'm thinking, and you know, I think I'll give an example in a moment. Orchids is an area where I think a lot of unnecessary names have been added and hasn't really helped us in terms of understanding the group particularly well, but they're not wrong. They're just, it's, it's a, a name change that doesn't really add a whole lot more information. At least in that case, it, the names do have a, uh, sort of tell you a bit about the structure, if you like, of that tree, but there are, there are worse examples as well. And also if they're per, poorly circumscribed or poorly defined, groups as well that's again not much well more than not much value it's it's not very it's bad and i give an example here again i've just picked one that happens to be algae but just ignore that fact uh, borsheri alpha borsheri beta these i used to work on this as a ph on my phd and this um fresh the, the descriptions if you like the technical descriptions were freshwater versus marine and that's it that was published since post 1753, since the dates when the algae started for this group, and it's a legitimate name, alpha and, and beta. And because that's a sufficient description, because the diagnosis has, has to be something that distinguishes the two from one another, it, it exists, but that's absolutely useless because this is a group of uh, organisms that grows in all kinds of habitats, looks different and you know, includes hundreds of species these days. So I wouldn't have a clue what those two are. There's no specimen to go back to. So that's a, that's a bad case. That's a bad example where the name just doesn't tell us anything more. I do give this one. So this, these are the orchid names. Some of you will be familiar with splitting up the spider orchids, Caledonia into many, many genera uh, or many, many more genera. And that's, as I said, that's not, it's not bad in the sense of that's telling you something. And it's because when you draw up the tree, you can see these little subgroups in Caledonia and a, a taxonomist has decided it's useful to recognize those because it tells us more about the variety and diversity. Um, to me, it's not adding enough information to make this worthwhile. And if you look, for example, at a, a blood spider orchid here, uh, this Caledonia, if you just go through a few changes over the last few years, this is the awful thing that can happen that, that makes people uh, get sick of and not like taxonomists because this kind of change um, through different uh, gen, 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 genus names is not being very helpful. It's making life difficult and not adding great value to us when we're, we're talking about this. It's meant to be a communication mechanism. It's meant to help you talk about something and carry some information. Now, it, these new names are in theory carrying a bit more information, but they're not really carrying enough to make it justifiable and worse still when we go back and forth. So that's a, that's a bad name change, that's for sure. Um, now, the, the, the code again, that the code of nomenclature says that a stable, you know, in its little sort of preamble, it's meant to be a stable system of naming of names. And it's, and it, you don't want, and it wants to get rid of names that cause error or ambiguity or throw science into confusion. So there are some kind of running instructions for when you do name changes, and sometimes they're adhered to, sometimes not. And you are meant to avoid the useless creation of names, which I like the useless creation of names. You probably feel that happens sometimes. And I, do, I think it does happen sometimes when people split things up too much. And to me, there's the value is not there. It's a cost benefit analysis and the value is not there, then it really isn't worth doing. And there are other things that come into uh, account, which I won't go into today, but sometimes the name will change because we need to correct its grammar. Um, sometimes the name isn't, doesn't, isn't quite rightly formed. Generally though, you stick with the name and the way it's spelled. So even some misspellings stay in place over time. Um, and now to finish with the good names, the ones, these are the ones I think are good when you, it changes in, the, in storage and transfer of scientific information. So you get a new change, it tells you that the, the earth is round and it's not um, flat. It tells you that um, there's a, a cure for COVID and there's a way of getting out of this pandemic. It's, it actually helps you give you something new. We learn more about our plants in Australia or, or wherever they are, world plants. It tells us something about biodiversity and the system is predictive. A lot of the work we do now with DNA as well 
is trying to get things to line up to, to work out that tree of evolution to get those monophyletic groups, monophyly, and, to, and that, that we find and we're convinced is a more predictive system. If you use that system and you name something in that system, it'll tell you more about the organism, it'll tell you what its chemistry is, it'll tell you about its history, tell you about its flowers, and that's a, a more useful system to use. And look at an example, one you'd be very familiar with, eucalyptus and angophora. I think this is a good change, even though it's an irritating one. Um, they, you know, if you, this is the tree on the right, the way you look at this is from left to right. So the, the base is, if you like, to the left. But when you look at, and this has changed a bit since I probably used this picture, but the, the taxonomic decision to be made here is that if you're going to accept angophora as a distinct genus, you need to accept this thing called corymbia, the bloodwoods. If on the, on the other hand, you decide to absorb angophora into eucalyptus, you could not, if you wanted, you could not have corymbia too. You could put them all into eucalyptus. So the options you have are, you have to, based on this science, if you want to, ref if you want to reflect the science, okay, you go eucalyptus, angophora, or corymbia, or you can have 12 genera, you can actually split up more. And Laurie Johnson did suggest that <laughs> at one time during his study and wasn't particularly well received or you could have one genus for the whole thing. And that's the decisions that the taxonomist or the recommendation the taxonomist had to make based on the information there. And, I, and which brings me to the point that a scientific name, good, bad or ugly is a hypothesis. So these are scientific hypotheses. They do get changed. They are up there for people to test. We might come along later or somebody will come along and have to change it. And that's because we know hopefully more about it Hopefully it's not an old name that's just been discovered. That's, as I say, ugly. Uh, hopefully it's not unnecessary splitting when we don't have to. And just to give you an example, and again, I'm, I'm being cheeky here, including um, algae, because they're things I, I work on. And I love promoting them, but pretend that's a flower and, and it's, a, it's, it's not a, a red alga. But you, I, I use these examples because I know them well. There's a, the track sperm means frog spawn, and that's a, a red alga that grows in streams. There was a name called Manila Formi described back in 1797. There was one that came in 1884 that called Rubescens for the red ones. And it changes color all over the place. So that's a stupid name. That's a, an ugly change because it's not a really good, useful split. Then, it, then someone discovered an older name called Gelatinosum. So we had to go and replace that name, 1753, you know that date. So we had to replace that. And then eventually there's a good change because I did all this work in Australia and found that the Australian things that look like this were distinct and had to be given a new name. So I called it this ugly thing, pseudo gelatinose. That's the worst species name you can give to anything. But you know what I'm getting at. It looks a bit like gelatinose, but it's not quite. So that gives you an example. There's an ugly change there. There's, there's a, a bad change because it's not good, doesn't tell you anything new. And a good change because it tells us the Australian algae in this case are distinctive. And this can happen in flowering plants too. So two rules, I reckon, if to remember for good taxonomy, they, that, that monophyly thing I talked about, taxonomic groups should include all descendants of a common ancestor, monophyletic, look out for that. And this is the one that we probably come undone on, we being taxonomists, minimise taxonomic change. We should not be unnecessarily changing things unless we feel there is a need to. Now, I've got just two slides here now, um, Jennifer. One's got a few well, I've called irritating example. I've just collected a few things. I might just flip them on. We could perhaps use this as a, a start of a discussion point. So I've got rosemary going into salvia, acacia, and we should really have racosperma technically, but the conservation of the name did occur. So we, we kind of won that one in terms of keeping um, the same name. But on the other hand, that was uh, a courageous decision worldwide. Um, Dryandra into Banksia, if we keep Dryandra, remember that monophyly thing, if we keep Dryandra, we have to split Banksia, if you follow the science and you want to keep that in your name. Same with Callistum and Tamaluca. It's the same thing again, you know, I, I don't, we don't need to go into the gory details, but what if you see a change like that one, again, it's a bit like Dryandra Banksia. It's where if you're going to, based on what we now know about those groups, to keep it really informative and telling us a lot, we would either need to split Melaleuca up into lots of things or we combine them. That's often the decision. Split it up more or combine, both of which have consequences, as you can see in those two examples. And then here's a, there's a bunch of things which um, 
I was just talking to Neville Walsh and my colleagues at the gardens and he said, oh, yeah. tomatoes. Can, yep. can I just interrupt him? I think we are going to lose it in a minute, so I might... Um, Yep. I've been trying to make it extend and I can't. Um, no. So I might have to send everybody a new link. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Well, this is a good place to stop. My last slide, too, in case we lose you all, has got some um, websites to look up. So I'll make sure we bring that back in a okay. bit later. Let me just click to the last slide because I'll get, I sent this through to Jennifer by email as well. And we might, we can, I'm happy to send this around. Probably not a lot here that's new to you, but um, Jennifer did ask. Uh, to just think about what the best sites are for looking up the latest names. And, in, you know, I'm based in Victoria, so I look up the state. I do, if you're after a local plan, I would suggest the state floor. And that gets you around the fact that different states sometimes have different views of, of nomenclature. And I'm, I sort of apologise for that. We're trying to get better at that, but there just happen to be, there's sometimes uh, historical reasons why people stick with names. And it's, it's very hard to unstick. So that I go to the state floras, there's one big floras there. There's Australian plant census, which is online. We're gradually going through all Australian plants and giving you what we think is the a preferred name. Sometimes there are alternatives. So it doesn't mean you can't use another name, but it's saying if you, if in doubt, or if you just want a name to use, use the one from this list. Plant list is a similar one from Q, not always correct or up to date, but it's pretty good as international list goes. That's for all plants around the world and they keep updating. Again, you, you might find a more recent paper, you might find something that is, is different, but if you just want a name and you want a consistent name, you can cross-reference it to something, use the plant list from Q. Hortflora, which we put out here, is good for Southeastern Australia. The only thing with that is it's, it's updated names from, um, that were in the book, but hasn't added anything since 1995. So while my pine, for example, is not in the book or not, in, or not online either. So it's a, a, it's a chunk missing from that, but if it's in there, you should be able to use the name. And then Botanic Garden, I, I do tend to migrate towards my Botanic Garden sites around the world. And the one in for South African plants I love is this one, Plants Africa. And I use that a lot for information as well as names. And again, if you read the, these articles or papers, you can kind of then then make your own choice. They might say, look, this is, most people do this, some do this, and then you sometimes have to make a call. So that, I'll go back if I can manage it to the one before, um, but that list will make sure it's available. Again, you can probably search for most of those things anyway. So I, I'm happy to leave it there. Should I drop the, the cross to Jennifer? Thank you, Tim. And thanks for bearing with us and um, ask, uh, ask Paul now to, to sort of talk about the names from a botanical or from a horticultural point of view or gar a really a gardening point of view, I guess. Um, and then perhaps we can have a little bit of a chat about some of the other names that people might, might be in doubt about. Um, but, but maybe Paul, if you'd like to, to, start to sort of take the floor. Yeah, is the audio working okay? Yes, we can, I can hear you. Okay, Tim's so. Body. <laughs> so um, probably what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about why it's important and the references I use and to showcase some of the plant names and how I found out that they had changed and how I go about checking the validity of some of those names. So probably the important thing is for the Hawk Media people, whether you're doing books, magazines or newspapers, the authenticity of your professionalism is very, very important. And I know through personal experience, if uh, anyone's going to write to the newspaper or write to the publisher, it's going to be about a complaint. They're not going to write and say how wonderful the writer is or the presenter is. They will try to highlight the errors. And quite often we'll get people who write and go, aha, this was spelt wrong or the botanical name was changed. Listen, we are humans. We make errors. We, you know, we just accept the fact that we are not always correct, but we try to do the best we can. And with some of the links that Tim has provided and some of the ones that I'm going to provide as well, we're really hoping that as a group of individuals, horticultural people with some of that expertise that we can fine tune that research so that we are providing that better information. So books are longer lasting, so they stay in print a little bit longer. So that kind of hangs over your head a little bit longer, unfortunately. But if you're going to go to a reprint, it gives you that opportunity to update that information, reprint it, make more money, sell more books, 
And then that way you can actually give that a new life with the latest information, more plants, but also correct nomenclature. Magazines, they roll through really fast. So trying to get the names right can be difficult with that time frame. And newspapers is also very difficult. And with uh, editors and the newspaper chief editors, quite often how we want names to be written, whether it's italics or not, or even the botanical usage of the var or cultivar or subspecies is quite often deleted. And all we can do as horticultural people is to press the importance of including those little elements, although that's quite often the thing that they delete thinking that it's not necessarily important. But we can try to reiterate the importance and how valuable that is as bot uh, botanical accuracy. Also online, um, I myself use the online portals a lot. I, I do love my books. I love, that's only a quarter of the books I have. There's all on the other side as well. Um, but books are a really good reference. And I know that books have had far more research into them compared to a lot of the websites and social media. Um, I find I get, I've stopped commenting on a lot of social media when wrong names come up. I think I'll let someone else do that particular task. I would rather just do more accuracy within the fields or the groups I'm involved with and let someone else tackle that particular um, or champion that role of botanical ac accuracy for some other particular people. Um, I think everyone needs to make their own decision how um, adamant they want to be on that particular role. With events, um, if you are being paid as a speaker or you've just been asked and you're donating your time, you want to be up there trying to present professionalism, accuracy. You want to be known and recognized as having authority. It's not good having someone um, discredit what you've said. So that research prior to you going on stage or doing that talk is very, very important. And it's also good for your own self-knowledge and confidence that you have done the research. And I said, I started with by saying that we are humans. We are fallible in some points. We will make errors. And as Tim highlighted, plants are always changing. I remember one um, issue we did, and after it was printed, we found out that it was actually changed two weeks earlier. And that's just a time thing. We can only just hope that we are up to date as much as possible. The other thing I've come across is that people think that it's just the horticultural um, you know, horticulturists that need to be perfect when it comes to botanical names. Well, no, whether you're a horticulture consultant, a designer, a landscape architect, a landscaper, um, uh, any of the landscape fields, even in the nursery industry, we do rely upon the accuracy because we are trying to convey that information to the public. And if we give the public the correct information with a name, they can accurately, accurately find that information online and then find a little bit more information about that particular plant, where it's from, how to best cultivate that particular plant. Um, I do know that... What? Sorry, I heard a what? That's right, it must have been a glitch or a hiccup. Um, I do know that, in, for example, one of the jobs I do is I work between the nursery industry and landscape architects. So we get a lot of names of plants for projects and we have to go through those names to source them for those particular projects. And quite often we'll get landscapers just sending in a common name or seriously incorrect botanical names. A good example is they will just write Cordeline rubra. And although the landscape designer is intending to go for cordyline rubra, the native green leaf plant, quite often the nurseries will supply cordyline fruticosa rubra, which is the non-native red foliage plant, and it causes all confusions on the job. Yeah, Tom's doing that going, causes so many problems with just the misunderstanding between the landscape architect, the client, and also the nursery. So that bit of transparency, trying, in our role, we quite often will ring up the landscaper and say, please, can you verify, are you after the native green leaf or the non-native red leaf version before we will supply a plant to a particular project? Um, the other thing is like when we have events, uh, members of the Hort Media Association in Queensland, we are asked to uh, man a plant clinic and we all get older, we get a little bit forgetful. So having a few books and references with us will also help. But asking others, 
asking the colleagues is really, really important to jog our memory. And if one of the others says, oh, it's been changed, like what was it, the dendrobiums to the doctrilla, and now they're arguing back to the dendrobiums for the native orchids. It's just one of those interesting arguments we quite often have, and we just go, use both names. We both understand what you're talking about. And with those multiple names, if you can have the current botanical name, but always include this, one of the synonyms so that it is showing that you do recognize the old name. Some of the gardeners will remember the old name, but will then, um, what, it'll make sense when they see that new botanical name for their horticultural exploration through their particular gardens. So just to give you an idea, I'm hoping this comes up the right way. If not, oh good, I actually produced it backwards in case it was a reverse camera. Always plan ahead when it comes to Zoom. You never know what camera you're going to be using. So I'm using someone else's camera right now. So that's reverse. This is the one I want. Okay, so recently the trend for indoor plants, everyone's growing philodendrons. And so their that's name the changed. Other one. Oh, Other okay. one. Oh, see, what yeah. I'm seeing is the right way around. No, so that that's, it. Like that's, that's it. That's it. Okay. It'll the camera that I'm seeing shows it backwards. So now I know that you see it right and I see it backwards on my camera. Okay, so the philodendron uh, bipinatophyllium has had a name change to that, that one, which people like to say and quite often say it backwards and I'll have to read it from the other one. Um, uh, Tim, you could probably say this better than me. <laughs> I'd say thematophyllium or th thematophyllum. I'll say yeah. that. Yeah, thematophyllum. Thank you very much. Botany helps. Um, the leopard tree had a name change. I was completely unaware of this and I should have known it. And then it appeared on one of the landscape specifications. And I went, I didn't know the, the genus, but I knew the species epithet. So it was just a case of just checking one of my portals or one of my um, websites that I used to check names and realize it was just the good old leopardwood trees. Um, sense of areas, as you probably all now know, because ABC did a bit of promo on it just recently, sense of areas are now Dracaenas. And, but the landscape architects, the gardeners just know sense of area. They're happy. <coughs> There's no need to necessarily force everyone over to Dracaena, but we can at least inform people of the name change. Um, a group of plants I love, Schefflerers, love them or hate them. I do actually like this group. I'm gonna make this flat. Um, the native Scheffler actinifolia, it's still the same. Um, I can't read that backwards on my screen. Give me a second. Scheffler um, albobracteatum is still the same. The Scheffler arboricolas have had a name change. Scheffler elegantissum has had a name change. And Scheffler Thailand or species Thailand has had a bit of a, a name change too. So. Up here in the subtropics and the tropics, these are really popular garden plants. They may not be popular down south. So this is why we use a lot of plants that down south you may never come across, you may never use, but for us, they're common plants. They're always appearing on landscape plans. And we just wanna keep the public and also our clients, the landscape architects, the designers and the councils up, um, I should say, supplied with the correct plants and also informed when it comes to writing and doing radio on the media tools. Um, and let's see if I've got all of the ones I want, just to show you them. Yep, yep, yep. And I don't want to take too much time because I thought the discussion might be more interesting. These are the ones, besides the ones that Tim uses, which I actually also do use, these are the main ones I have as book bookmarks on my computer. Grin, uh, The World, Flora Online, Plants List, and Australasian Virtual Herbarium. So these are permanent bookmarks on my computer. So whenever I get a botanical name, I put it immediately into the search tool just to check how they are. And it doesn't hurt putting those bookmarks on your computer if you're always using botanical names. I think it's just a bit of professionalism. I believe it just shows that the People who are either speaking, writing, or doing social media, you're just kind of just being a little bit more specific and, as I said, professional in the line of duty that you are doing. Um, you don't have to go overboard. I just think it's um, a matter of personal, uh, professional 
action to do the best you can with trying to keep people up to, up to date with the names that you are using. Um, so they're the main ones I use. I'm quite happy to share those names and I'm sure Tim will share those names through Jennifer to everyone who's on this group. But the thing is with botanical names, you can use books, magazines, everything else to your, at your disposal, but join garden clubs. I use on social media, I use Facebook groups, very specific groups. So if I'm writing or I'm just keenly interested in Hoyas, I will join a Hoya group. Same with the Aroids group. I find the best information, the latest information for botanical accuracy, naming and clarification for identification is through those groups. Not the generic groups like, you know, Brisbane Enthusiastic Gardeners group, but choose a very specialized group. And I find that that is the most helpful, um, accurate information that I've been able to find. And through those groups, I've actually been linked to people overseas who are the experts on those particular plant types. And I've been able to get information sent straight to me just to clarify when the name was changed, what it is and why it's different from another one. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Sorry, sorry. I, I tried to shove a lot in within yeah, the short period. That's, that's great. I think, I think everyone's, um, you know, really taken that on board. And Tim's, I hope everyone's reading the, the, the messages that are coming up in the chat line as well. I'm seeing, um, I'm missing all of them. I'm, I'm now yeah. just reading them, sorry. So um, Tim's just putting a few things in there. Now, I guess um, one of the things I really want to ask, and perhaps it's um, asking Tim, is how long do you give for the name to be accepted? Because I know that, that just because something's published in botanical circles, it does, it can take a long time to, to filter out. And even if, you know, as um, Paul's saying, we're being up to date and checking everything, uh, and you tell somebody a name and it's not being used in the nursery industry, I just wonder how helpful sometimes it is to be up to date. Yeah, I, I reckon that's a great question. It's a really hard one to answer because there's a tendency sometimes, and I find this in the orchid world, as soon as a paper is published with a new name, uh, it's amazing. Um, people in the, who are collecting orchids will use that name a day after it's published. They just get out there, they're excited about having sometimes in a negative way, excited about having something no one else knows and you use the new name and then you can correct someone. So why aren't you using the new name? Whereas in the botanic gardens and in Herbaria, we would tend to wait a bit. So when it gets published, the paper comes out, you read it. Uh, for us, we wait until it gets into our census, which in Victoria is Vic Flora. That When it gets into there, that's officially accepted. It can take, um, it could be a few months. It, sometimes it could be, if it's a really comp complex one, we might sit on it for uh, six months or a year. And this is really unhelpful to you, but, it, but just because something gets published and if you track down, and these days it's so much easier to get the publication, it doesn't mean anyone has accepted. So you need to give it time to settle. It may be nobody accepts that name, like it's a hypothesis. One person publishes it, they might be a bit radical and too radical and they've made, you know, and people just don't accept it and you'll find that we never make the change. It's hard to advise you on what to do there other than don't, don't feel you have to jump on a new name really quickly. I think we all as a community should relax a bit. Um, you know, keep up to date as much as we can using those sites. If you're going for long-term publication, get the latest name, but don't feel you've got to rush in within a day or a week of a new name publishing just I mean, you mentioned that one that came out two weeks before you published a, a, a book or something. I, I don't know what you do in that case. It just, you know, it's <laughs> it's hard. It's, you know, th there's no real clear answer there, I'm sorry. And the, the other thing I, I sort of think is that um, I sometimes use, when I find out there's a new name and I'm not sure how accepted it is, and, I, and when I know it's not actually out in the trade, I actually put the new name as a synonym in brackets and keep going with the old name. I think that's okay because um, look, it's it's about communication all the time. And if you've got both names, I mean, what you're doing is giving as much helpful information as you can. You're covering your bets. And, and look, I, I don't think anyone can criticize you for the order you put those in. You know, a pen, pen might six months down the track say, how come you did that? But it's, you know, I think you're doing the right thing. Just, just do what's practical and pragmatic. Do you think it's possible to have the, your recommended sites, yours and Paul's recommended sites on the HMA website, please? I think that would be a great asset. Okay. Yeah, should be able to. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I did, just in case you didn't catch, I, I suddenly thought I'd put a couple of sites to sort of not you, which is an odd thing to do in the chat, only because there's a, a site called the Australian Plant Name Index and the International Plant Name Index, and you might end up on them sometimes. They're really good for getting spellings and old names and historical histories, and they, they give you every single name published. They used to yeah. be called Q Index in the old days. You don't want that. I mean, you want that site if you're into that, but that doesn't tell you the current name. Just be a bit careful if you get into one of those sites. Okay. So maybe that can actually be added to the notes on the HMA website. Yeah, okay. One of the key things with a lot of those websites, it does depend upon how often they're updated. And Tim did make a highlight on one of those groups. I use Grin a lot, but it is seriously outdated. It's not updated very much but I find some of the information in there is really helpful in understanding where the plants come from naturally. Yeah. But the other thing, Tim, I was wondering, I always think that we seem to go in cycles with botanic names and there's sort of a lot of lumping and then there's a lot of splinting, splitting yeah. and then there's a lot of lumping. Are we in a cycle at the moment where we're getting more and more names? We're doing a lot of splitting maybe because yeah. of uh, new technology? Yeah, I think we're in a splitting phase. Um, it goes by groups a bit, though, I find. like, But that we are in a bit of splitting phase because we're, the more molecular DNA work we do, we find things are not quite right. And, and the tendency is to split, even in the groups I work on. I, I try and fight this a bit because people love, in, in a way, it's easier and simpler to kind of split things down. And when you get a single species in a single genus, like, like my one named after me, it carries very little information. It doesn't tell you much yet that's the way people are going. So I, I think, yes, we're in a splitting phase. Yes, it's because of new technologies. It will pass. I like will eventually get things a bit sorted and there'll be some big changes and then we'll start to resettle things. But I, I and, you know, and again, I always go back to orchids. We, we went through a splitting phase where now I think a lot of people are lumping back up a bit just to make it more useful as a, as a system, even though the splitting was not incorrect. So. You're quite right. It get, it's a bit phase driven and it's a big technology driven. Right. And do you think there's some that we should be watching out for at the moment? Are there, are there people that are studying some of our common garden plants who are about to launch with a new name and, and perhaps we need our antennas up to be, be looking out? I mean, I like the whole rosemary salvia thing, which um, I think yeah. took a lot of people by surprise. Are, are there things like that on the horizon that we can watch out for? Look, it's, it's hard to predict those things. The almost certainly yes, but I can't tell you what they are. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> um, just because of the nature. I mean, Grevillea hake is one that I, I can't, I'm not sure if that's been officially put out, but that's potentially from the work done there. I think hake is going to end up replacing Grevillea if, if they go. But, but again, by saying that, it may be when they do a bit more work and they get better information, they decide that's not quite right. So sometimes you can, you know, as I say, jump in too early. Um, look, every group's being, every, everything's being re-examined with molecular stuff and some, I'm trying to think what's, whether anything is, is sort of more vulnerable to name changes than anything else. Not really, it just depends on the groups people work on. And you could say something like eucalyptus, people have worked to death and so you're not going to expect it to change much more at the higher level. He, he says very confidently and then you'll get a paper tomorrow that'll tell you someone has, but you know, groups that have been well studied for long years tend to sort of sort themselves out and get resolved, but it's probably those little obscure groups. Um, and I can't think of anything, I'm trying to think of people at the gardens who are working on things. Um, nothing, I've, if something comes to mind, I'll, I'll let, let you know, but nothing jumping out, Jennifer, at the moment. And, and I guess if we put all these, this information up on our website, we're going to be helping members um, keep up to date. So that's probably the best thing that we can do. But it really is up to individuals to keep themselves up to date, isn't it? I mean, there's yeah, nothing. Like I said, just be careful about not being too, it seems weird to say not too up to date. You can get excited by this and get to go down a, a, a funnel of excitement with name changes. And I just find it can be, because there is, it is difficult and complex. And so I guess that, that just comes back to relying on these accumulator sites like Flora's or a Botanic Gardens or a, a, an international checklist and the ones that Paul and I put up rather, because if you go to the 
if you, you know, it's fun to go to say the latest issue of Australian Systematic Botany and see what's been published there and do that if you're into plants. I think it's really interesting. Just don't necessarily jump on the name change or don't panic. Just give it time to digest a bit. Mm. Right now, has anyone got any other questions that they want to put forward? Nope. Any burning issues? <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone's asked it. there, uh, Jennifer, about using the authority after botanical name. I actually don't. Now, that's a really interesting one. I, I keep ripping them off names in a lot of publications that I'm involved in because it's not really use, useful. It's it's useful in taxonomic publications because sometimes a name needs the author to tell you a bit about it. So if I'm doing taxonomy and publishing, it is. Even in, I find it in sort of books on general plants where people put the authority in and two things happen. One is no one knows what it means. The general reader doesn't know why there's suddenly someone's name sticking off the end of it. And secondly, it doesn't actually give, usually, you know, 99% of the time, it's not going to help you separate two names because the, those the binomial tells you everything you need so my preference is not not everyone will say this my preference is not to use them unless you're in a really really technical situation and you need to put the authority i know that's not always the case but that would be my suggestion yeah. Yeah. Thanks, i mean i think we, we aim to get the the genus and the species right yeah, don't <laughs> um, worry about the other stuff and the plant family probably that's important as well of course yeah mm. Any other um, questions? And, well, just a little comment talking about, I noticed um, Tim said it's good to use a common name when possible. And I agree because sometimes people are just extraordinarily pretentious and around for the sake of it, um, which is really a bit isolating for, not, you know, for some people. But then you get the other extreme where people might use, um, I, I've, on a couple of articles, I've put in botanical names because that's actually, to me, they were common names. And the editor has had a look and thought, well, they don't understand this. They've Googled that name and they've come up with some common name and published it. And I've thought, what is this plant they're talking about? I have no idea. I've never heard of it. You know, it's yeah. completely alien. So there's always that balance, um, isn't it? Yeah, and um, uh, it's bronia or something. Yeah, if I'm writing about a bronia, I wouldn't call it something else. I can't even think, is there a common name for bronias? Probably not. I mean, there might be. I'm sure if you Googled, you'd find one, but why would we call it anything else? So, yeah, I, I agree. It works both ways a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, th look, thank you so much, everybody, and thanks for bearing with us with that terrible glitch in the, <laughs> the middle, which, of course, won't be there in, when people look at this later online. Thank you very, very much, Tim, for giving up so much of your precious time to talk to us. I think we've all really benefited. And Paul, thank you for really um, putting forward just why we need to be on our toes. And both of you, thank you for sharing your resources too.